Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone tonight in Jesus' name. And I pray that the word of the Lord will enrich every life. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Father, we thank you today. We bless your name. We thank you for what you have learned already. And we thank you for all our leaders and workers and all the people who are here. All those who are listening everywhere. We're asking, O oh Lord, you reach every life with your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Apply your word by your spirit to every heart. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Tonight we're looking at Exodus chapter 32. And I'm reading from verse 26. Exodus chapter 32. Reading from verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. The question, Who is on the Lord's side? Something has happened before this time. Moses went to the top of the mountain. He went to meet the Lord. He went to collect the law of God for the children of Israel. But then, as he didn't tell them when he'll be coming back, they became weary. And they were wondering, what has happened to him? When is he coming back? And he said, as for this Moses, who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we know not what is become of him. Because of that, they told Aaron, because God, that will go before us, because we need a God to lead. Eventually, God saw that. And in verse 7, the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou hast brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. And then it says what they had done. Moses came back to them and he saw them, saw their condition. That's why he now gave the call who is on the Lord's side. Tonight we're looking at the word on the subject constantly abiding on the Lord's side. Constantly abiding on the Lord's side. The question that uh, Moses posted to them required a practical answer. It wasn't just a movement on the physical, on the physical side. It says, let him come to me. That means, number one, separation from the world and full surrender unto the Lord. They were all in their corruption. Who is on the Lord's side? The way they were now, they were not on the Lord's side. Who then will be on the Lord's side? That will mean to separate from the corruption of the land and then to surrender totally unto the Lord. Who is on the Lord's side? That implies coming out of false worship. They were worshiping idols now. And that was false worship. And the Lord wanted them to come out of that false worship. Who is on the Lord's side? Who is coming out of false worship and coming into scriptural worship? The question again, who is on the Lord's side? They are backsliding. They had gone away from the Lord. They had turned away from the commandments of the Lord. And the Lord was now saying, Who is on the Lord's side that will turn away from their backsliding and then now come to believe the truth? Who is on the Lord's side? The implication is, Who is going to abandon the corruption and the corruptors and cleave unto God and to godliness? Who is on the Lord's side? That means seeking not to please religious sinners because they were still religious. These are the gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. But now they turned, they were to turn from those religious sinners 
and seek to please the Lord only. Please the Lord always and please the Lord ever. As you think about our lives, and we're not just talking about those who have not been saved. These children of Israel were saved before. They had known the Lord, but because they went away from the Lord, that's why the Lord is now calling them back from the things they are going to do. In our offices, corruption is there. In our offices, we know the fraudulence there. And the Lord is asking, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. The people that will recognize corruption is evil. Fraud is evil. And they come out from among them. They're still there. They're still working there. They're still interacting with the people. But they will not practice the corruption in the land. In our families, in various families, there is corruption. There is idolatry. There is occultism. And there is false worship. Even though we're living in that family, the Lord is calling us and is saying, who is on the Lord's side? Is asking us, coming out of the corruption in our families. Our children go to school. Our teachers teach in schools. There's corruption everywhere. In the school, in the college. And the Lord is giving us a call. The Lord is saying, who is on the Lord's side? As you look at various uh, professions, in the land and in the world, any profession, the teaching profession and other kinds of profession, there is corruption that is peculiar to every profession in the land. And you are working somewhere and there is a kind of corruption connected with the work you do. And the Lord is asking, if you are on the Lord's side, if you are a child of God, the peculiar corruption connected with that area of work who is on the Lord's side, let him come unto me. So then, as we look at our lives, we're not just applying this to newcomers, new converts, and new believers, or sinners alone who need to come out of their sins. It concerns everyone, all of us, that we come out to the Lord's side, constantly abiding. After we come out, and we're now on the Lord's side, we now constantly abide on that Lord's side so that the Lord will see that we're living a life that is pleasing unto him. Three things we're looking at today. Number one, the pervasive corruption of the Lord's standard. The Lord gave them a standard and the Lord gave them the word. That was the Lord's standard. Whether Moses was there or not, he had a covenant with them, with the children of Israel, and he wanted them to abide by that standard. And the Lord is now calling out of that pervasive corruption, the pervasive corruption of the Lord's standard. Point number two, the purposeful call to the Lord's side. Purposeful call to the Lord's side. When the Lord gave a call through Moses, it had a purpose and it had its implication and as the lord is coming to you and is saying are you on the lord's side i have something to do i have a work to do i have a standard to raise i have the word to spread who is on the lord's side that will fulfill the purpose for which that call is given the purposeful call to the lord's side point number three the progressive consecration to the Lord's service. Progressive consecration to the Lord's service as the Levites came out. After they were called, the call was general. And they gave a definite decision and a definite response to that call. Now when they came out as Levites, they were given an assignment to do and they were told to consecrate themselves and as days went by months went by years went by that consecration the lord expected they will continue they will persevere in fact they'll progress in that consecration point number three then the progressive consecration to the lord's service point number one the pervasive corruption of the Lord's standard. 
Let's see what had happened to them before that call came. Because if we do not know the history, if we do not know the background, we will not be able to understand what to do now with the call that came to them. Number one, the pervasive corruption. That's the kind of corruption that had pervaded the people. It was contagious. It defiled all of them. It, pure, it uh, putrefied them. And it started in a little way. It started with just some selected people coming to Aaron and saying, Aaron, what are we going to do? Why don't you make us gods that will go before us? And from that little beginning, it came to the rest of the children of Israel. Corruption permeates a whole congregation and a weak Aaron then becomes the source and the avenue through which that corruption pervades the whole nation. Actually, Aaron's weakness became a weakening addiction. Aaron's weakness, he was weak. And because of that weakness, that now became a weakening addiction, and the people just went from bad to worse. Let's look at Exodus chapter 32. And I'm reading from verse 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, no more my people, they were backsliding, for thy people, no more the people of God. When God was sending Moses to uh, Pharaoh, he said, Let my people go. But now because of their backsliding, it says, Thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. It's a free choice. It's a personal choice that became a national choice. They have corrupted themselves. That is not the Lord corrupting them. And it's not another nation now coming from outside corrupting them. Their corruption came from their own heart, their depravity. In verse 8, they have turned aside quickly out of the way. That tells us somebody can be saved, somebody can be redeemed, called out of Egypt. And yet, there's no eternal security. They are there, they are always there. They are saved, they are always saved. They are redeemed, they are always redeemed. They are beloved people of God, they are always beloved people of God. No, it says they have turned aside quickly out of the way. They were in the way before, but now they are out of the way, the way which I commanded them. They have made them a multi cow, and they have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen these people, and behold, it's a stiff-necked people. That means they were rebellious against God. They were stubborn against the word of God. They will go their own way. They were self-willed. It says, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my rod may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, later Moses was recounting, recalling, reminding them of what happened at that time. And Deuteronomy chapter 9 gives us some details that makes us understand the kind of corruption. And not only that, the attitude of God to that corruption. Not only that, the consequence on Aaron and the consequence on the children of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 12. And the Lord said unto me, Arise, get thee down quickly from hence, for thy people, still thy people, because of backsliding, backsliding, 
which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They are quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten image. Furthermore, the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen these people, and behold, it's a stiff neck people. Look at verse 20 now. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron. Not only that Moses was angry with Aaron, the Lord was angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. Again, that shows you the word of God. It shows very clearly if somebody had been in the Lord, had been a leader in the church, had been one of the preachers and the pastors, but now he deviates and he goes away from the Lord. The Lord is angry with the sinner, is angry with the backslider, is angry with the minister that makes other people to turn away from him. The Lord was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. And if Aaron had died in that condition, under that condemnation, whatever you say at the burial ground, and whatever mourning may take place in the nation, Aaron would not have gone to heaven. Aaron would have perished, would have gone to hell forever, dying under the anger of God. Indignation of God brings judgment, eternal judgment upon the man, the minister, or whoever. And I prayed for Aaron also at the, at the same time. He prayed for him. And that was why God had mercy. I want you to understand that what Aaron did was a peculiar thing. Other people could have done something like that and it would not affect the nation. Take, for example, one of the mixed multitudes decided he wanted to raise up an idol. The others will deal with him and they will not follow after that. But when a leader raises up an idol, when a leader goes into false doctrine, you have heard it before, a leader's sin becomes a leading sin. He leads them into idolatry. He leads them into falsehood. He leads them into backsliding. After all, as a leader, if he is doing that and is still preaching, if he can do that and is still ministering, if he is doing that and he still has the label of a leader, well, that means that we can do it too. A leader's sin is a leading sin. How about a pastor? A pastor that decides he will change the standards. He wants to make it easier for the people. He wants to a kind of doctor it and he wants to uh, mutilate it. He wants to modify the word of God so that the people will find it easy. Times are hard. Situations are hard. And so if these people are going to be able to follow, we shall simplify it. That becomes a sin for that pastor. A pastor's sin some becomes a pervasive sin. That all the others that see that the pastor is doing that. The pastor is going that way. The pastor is having a concubine. The pastor is marrying his second wife. And the first wife is still alive. The pastor is becoming fraudulent. And the pastor is doing this and that. A pastor's sin soon becomes a pervasive sin. How about a minister? He ministers the word, or he ministers in prayer, or he ministers in any area. As a minister, as a sectional leader, see him. He's doing this and he's doing that. And he has uh, so done it that Aaron can do whatever he wanted to do and nobody will know and nobody will challenge him. He was the highest above all the people besides Moses. Well, Aaron, a minister is doing that. A minister's sin is a misleading sin. 
it misleads other people. They are not reading their Bible. They are reading you. They are not reading the Word of God. They are reading the watchmen. They are reading the people who are declaring the Word of God unto them. Are you a minister like that? Are you a pastor like that? Are you a leader like that? That you are not careful in your life. And you are not dedicated to the word of God. You are careless. You are backsliding. You do evil. You go places. Ministers should not go. A minister's sin is a misleading sin. That man says is a shepherd over the people. The shepherd is a pastor. The shepherd is an overseer. The shepherd is watching over the people. But it's not living straight. It's not living a righteous life, a victorious life. It's not living above sin. It can have some compromises and it can cut edges and do things that it will excuse. People see that and a shepherd's sin quickly becomes a shielded sin. They so respect him as shepherd. All the other people who are preaching, they don't go to that area. They shield that sin. It's a shepherd's sin. The shepherd is doing that. If we say that, if we preach that, he will think we're preaching against him. We love him to his destruction. We respect him to his damnation. And we will cover him. And we will not say anything that will make people remember that this is the shepherd's sin. So they shield that, and then that affects the whole congregation. Our fathers in the family, our mothers in the family, must understand that their children are watching them. They see what they do. They see what the father does when the mother is not around. They see what the mother does when the father is not around. And if a father who claims to be a Christian indulges in any evil, indulges in any sin in the family, a father's sin becomes a festering sin to become like canker. And it will eat into the lives of the children. The mother, too, that lives a careless life, the mother, too, that lives a simple life, the mother cheer that has false worship and false profession and has sin in her life, a mother's sin ultimately becomes a molding sin. It will be molding the lives of those children and the lives of the people who are living with that family. A mother's sin becomes ultimately a molding sin. Eventually, the idolatry, eventually, the corruption that came into Israel became open. Everybody did it. It became a naked sin, open before all, and known unto all. And there was nobody to check anyone, and life went on as usual. A naked sin soon becomes a nurtured sin. They nurse it like a baby and they protect it like a baby. It's a naked sin and they now cherish it. A naked sin becomes a nurtured sin. A little sin that comes in into the congregation becomes like a licensed sin. It's a little sin. Go ahead. It's a little sin. Nobody is going to grumble at this. It's a little sin. Nobody is going to say that, you know what, we can, uh, we have some little, little buds in our lives. And that little sin becomes a licensed sin. And the people that come in, whether they are workers or they are members, and they see that this is going on, it's like they have a license. That little sin has become a a licensing, actually an open sin, becomes an operative sin. An open sin, when it started, you were shocked. When people did that the first time, 
your workshop. But the people who, who commit those open sins, they continue. It's like many, many years ago, if you saw somebody taking bribe, the fellow himself taking that bribe will try to hide. But later, they did it, and did it, and did it, until they operate that way. It's part of the operation now. An open sin becomes an operative sin. Corruption is evil. It ends in eternal destruction, eternal devastation, eternal damnation. That's why the Lord is warning us that we should not be involved in the corruption. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. Hosea chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 9. Hosea chapter 9, verse 9. They have deeply corrupted themselves, not just superficially. It entered their heart. It entered their soul. It came into their character. It's now part of their lifestyle. They have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah. Therefore, he will remember their iniquity and he will visit their sin. Look at Malachi chapter 2. In Malachi chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 8. Malachi chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 8. But she had departed out of the way. You see what happened since the time of Exodus? And it went on and on, and it's coming now to the end of the Old Testament. And it says, she have departed out of the way. He have caused many to stumble at the law. He have caused many to stumble. We don't know what is right anymore. We don't know what the standard is anymore. Because they have so corrupted themselves from the Lord's standard. From the Lord's word. From the Lord's will. From the Lord's revelation. That now there's confusion in the minds of the people. And many people have turned away from the Lord. He have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have kept, ye have not kept the ways, my ways, and have been partial in the Lord. They are still religious, but they are partial in the Lord. They are still religious. They're still worshipping, but they're not worshipping the true God. We come to Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. We're reading from verse 17. There are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they are lured through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that are clean escaped from them who live in error, while they promise them liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption. Those who go into corruption, they soon become the servants of corruption. And it says, For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. Verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through laws and through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Those who tell us once saved, always saved, the means, the teaching of the word of God. 
the Lord said, after they had escaped the pollutions of the world. That's salvation. That's redemption. And it says, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They were saved by the Lord. They are now again entangled therein. They backslide. It says when they backslide like that, if they die in that condition, they overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Let's come back to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. I'm reading from verse 31. Exodus 32, verse 31. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, these people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive them, forgive their sin, he didn't finish the sentence. The Lord couldn't forgive them without their repentance. It takes repentance before forgiveness will come. Then Moses said, And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. When we are saved, redeemed, forgiven, our names are written in the book of life. If we go back into sin, if we backslide, if we not become servants of Satan, agents of Satan, the names are taken out of the book of life. And Moses said, forgive them. If not, blot out my name out of the book that thou was written. Verse 33. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever have sinned against me, Aaron, the leaders of the tribes of Israel, the children of Israel, whatever their name, whatever their status, whatever the number, God is no respecter of persons. Whosoever have sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. In Joshua chapter 24, reading from verse 20, Joshua chapter 24, verse 20. Look at what the word of God says. Joshua 24, verse 20. If ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after he had done you good. He be merciful unto you favorable unto you and he has blessed you he has done you good if you backslide if you turn away from him if you forsake the Lord and go to some strange gods then that same God that now becomes the God of judgment he will turn and he will do you hurt he will consume you after he had done you good Romans chapter 11, reading from verse 22. Romans 11, verse 22. In Romans 11, verse 22, Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God on them which fell severity. They were standing before. You couldn't fall if you were not standing. You couldn't go out if you had not come in. They were in the grace of God. They were redeemed, but now they fell on them which fell severity. But toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, the goodness that saves, the goodness that makes you a child of God, the goodness that shows mercy on you, and now you are in the kingdom. It says concerning you, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be caught up. Thou also, you stand by grace, 
you stand because of the righteousness. But if you turn back, you also will be cut off. Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, whether it's an Aaron, or a Saul, or a Solomon, or a Samson, or a Judas Iscariot, if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But who are not of them who draw back unto perdition? Those who draw back into idolatry, those who draw back into corruption, they draw back into perdition. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul, he wants us to continue. He tells us in John chapter 15. John chapter 15 verse 2. In John chapter 15 verse 2, every branch in me saved, every branch in me attached to the Lord, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch in me that will no more bear the fruit of righteousness, and I is living like the world, and is gone back into corruption, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Verse 6, in verse 6, if a man abides not in me, if a man takes my salvation for granted, and he takes the kingdom of God for granted, and he abides not in the Lord, if a man abides not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burnt. Corruption becomes pervasive. Corruption becomes punishable. Corruption leads to perdition. And those who continue in that, and they die in that condition, they are lost forever. So Moses came back to them. And he knew that something must be done. Because God had said he wanted to destroy all the Israelites and make of Moses a greater nation. He had pleaded with God. He had prayed before God. But then, for the favor of God to come back to them, they must do the first works. They must repent again. They must turn to the Lord again. That's why he came to them in Exodus chapter 32, verse 26. Exodus chapter 32, verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Who is on the Lord's side? And if you're on the Lord's side, it will not be a mental asset. Yes, I'm the, on the Lord's side, and you stay there with them. I'm on the Lord's side, and you continue in evil. I'm on the Lord's side, and you continue worshiping the golden cow. I'm on the Lord's side, and you're supporting Aaron. I'm on the Lord's side, and you remain in darkness. If you're on the Lord's side, come unto me. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. Point number two now. The purposeful call to the Lord's side. The purposeful call to the Lord's side. Who is on the Lord's side? Moses was calling them back to God's prescribed worship. Moses was calling them to God's perfect word. Moses was calling them to God's perpetual will. This is the will of God. It's perpetual. And it's eternal. It's forever. I am God. I change not. And because they are deviated, 
he now called them who is on the Lord's side. What did that mean? What does that mean today? They had made graven images. And the Lord had said, Thou shalt not make any graven image. Who is on the Lord's side? He was calling them out of disobedience to God's word. You shouldn't have made and shouldn't have worshipped the golden image. And so if you're on the Lord's side, abandon that that brought you to corruption. Number two, the Lord had told them, Thou shalt not bow down to any image, any idol. That's exactly what they had done. And because they had done that, the call now is, as you about, you will not make a covenant with the Lord. I will not bow to idols anymore. That's what it means. Who is on the Lord's side? The Lord had said he will not give his glory to another. But these children of Israel with Aaron, they're giving the glory of God to idols. They said, these be thy gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. That's not true. God brought them out by a mighty hand and by great signs. But they gave the glory of God unto idols. Who is on the Lord's side? That means that you will not continue to give the glory that belongs to God to strange gods. You know, when they backslid, they made a feast, I don't know, trust feast, and they were eating from that idolatrous feast. And the call of Moses was, who is on the Lord's side, stop eating in that feast. Stop, con don't continue partaking in of the feast that is dedicated unto idols. Who is on the Lord's side? You have violated the commandment of the Lord, and so do not continue partaking in of the idolatrous feast. Who is on the Lord's side? You will see that as you read the whole story, they were now copying, imitating the pagans and the heathen in their practices. Who is on the Lord's side was calling them out of their imitation to the heathens. And when you have started imitating the heathens and the pagans, when you want to get married, all the ceremonies you do, they are not from the world, they are from the world. When you have a child and you want to do whatever you want to do, name is ceremony, dedication, what you want to do is not in the world, it's what's coming from the world. We are copying the practices of the heathens. And he's saying, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And you see that already they were naked because Aaron had made them naked. The idol worshippers, they worship their idols in scanty dressing and in nakedness, and they are started copying the dressing and the appearance of those idol worshippers who is on the Lord's side, abandon all those attires, all the clothing, all the semi-nakedness with which you are worshipping your idol, who is on the Lord's side, come out of that. Do you know they were dancing and singing? And it wasn't the singing of the children of God. It was the dancing of those idol worshippers who is on the Lord's side. Stop the dancing. Stop the worldly music and come unto the Lord. Look at Exodus chapter 32. In Exodus chapter 32, I'm reading from verse 18. Exodus 32, verse 18. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for victory, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. The voice of them that sing do I hear. Verse 19, 
And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. He saw the calf and the dancing. They are totally gone into the world. Apparel, appearance, clothing, scanty, naked, and the music of the world, the dancing of the world, the singing of the world. That's why Moses said, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. When you're on the Lord's side, all those things of the world, you abandon. All those things of the world, you kick out of your life. So that now you go in the right way. You go in the righteous way. The same call the Lord is giving us today is Second Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them. Is your family doing anything? You know? That is contrary to the standard of the word of God come out in your school are the children the fellow students doing anything you know, that shows corruption that shows sin you know, that show evil come out in your office are they doing anything you know, that shows there's no regard for the law of God there's no honesty there's no holiness there's no righteousness come out in your community, are they doing things that pollute life, that corrupt life, come out from among them and be separate, be distinct, be totally different, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. You have to come out first before he receives you. That's the word of the Lord. Come out. Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16. We're reading from verse 26. Numbers chapter 16. Verse 26. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men. Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men. You'll not be in uh, association with them in business. You'll not be in association with them uh, in social matters. If you are really standing for the Lord, and you are coming to the side of the Lord, you will depart from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing of theirs. You cannot say, I have come out and I pay your salary. I have come out. I don't have anything to do with them. They're feeding you. I have come out. They're giving you gifts, and yet you know that they get their money by fraudulent means or by evil means. It says, you will touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sin. Ezra chapter 10, we're reading from verse 11, Ezra Chapter 10, reading from verse 11. Now therefore, make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers, and do his pleasure. That, that's what it means to come to the Lord's side. It's not just that I'm saved, I'm born again, I'm a child of God, and our practices, our lifestyle, does not show to the world that we're totally different. They love us, they accept us, they approve of us because we're doing exactly like they want and we please them. It says over here that we'll do God's pleasure 
and separate yourselves from the people of the land. Separate yourself from the people of the land and from strange wives. Strange wives. Well, you say you are married already, but your child is going to marry. Your child is marrying a strange wife, a stranger to the word of God, a stranger to the salvation of God, a stranger to the doctrine of the word of God. And then you say, well, what can I do? I'm his father. What can I do? I'm her mother. And because of that, if I don't go along with her now, I will lose the child completely. You have lost the child already. If the child is not saved, get into that age, he's going to get married, she's going to get married, and then he goes to be, uh, bring a stranger. And you say, well, this is not church matter. This is my personal matter. Separate yourself from all those strange people. That's the word of God. That's what it means. And we don't have the right to go and tell other people who is on the Lord's side, come out and come unto me. If we ourselves are not totally, completely, perfectly on the Lord's side, a compromiser cannot go and tell a group of compromisers who is on the Lord's side, let him come unto me. A person that is still feasting with them, with the people of the world, cannot go back to the people who are doing the feast. Well, I'm part of you, but who is on the Lord's side, let him come unto me. We cannot come unto you because we are not tried. Your way is not straightforward. You have not broken away distinctly from the people of the world. If you are like Aaron and you are still there in the midst of them, coming to you will mean that we're still in perdition. It means if you're going to call other people to come out, you yourself must make a break, totally come out. And there must not be any compromise at all for any reason. Come out unto me. Isaiah chapter 52. I'm reading from verse 11. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 11. Depart ye, depart ye, go out from this. Touch no unclean thing. Touch no unclean thing. Idolatry, that's unclean. Occultism, that's unclean. Blood money, that's unclean. Money gotten out of destroying other people, that's unclean. Any sin that has association with Satan or with sin, with the world, is evil. Depart ye, depart ye. Go out from this. Touch no unclean sin. Go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. In Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 21. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. Flee also useful lusts. Don't just walk away, flee. Don't just, um, you know, make up, I'm, I'm trying to decide. I'm trying to make up my mind. And I, I want to do it wisely. If I pull out so suddenly, out of that corruption, if I pull out so suddenly, out of the midst of the people who have been doing those evil things together, it will be noticed. I want to pull out gradually and slowly, and I want to pull out in a wise way so that they don't think I'm condemning them. I want to do it nicely. There's no way to come out of evil nicely. Come out of evil slowly. Come out of evil gradually. Come out of evil pleasantly. You come out and you flee. At verse uh, 22, flee also useful lost. 
and follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. I read from verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye abstain from fornication. You see, but when we're saved, there's no fornication. That's right. But remember the words of Jesus. If you look on a woman to lost after her, you have committed that fornication, adultery in your heart, in your office. You are so near. Those ladies go to lunch together and then you do unspeakable things together. What's that? And then the pictures you exchange. What's that? The appreciation, admiration you have for that strange woman. What's that? And the way you go with those people, that's how the people of the world do it to you. But it says, this is the will of God. Even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Don't be like them in any way that no man go be, be, beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Fraud is of the devil, is of the world, is sinful. Nobody can claim to remain saved while it's fraudulent. Nobody can claim I'm still a child of God while it's fraudulent. Come out of that totally because that the Lord is the avenger of all such as we have also forewarned you and testified for God has not called us unto uncleanness but unto holiness that's the call we have he has called us unto holiness first Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 22 First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Appearance of evil. Remember the children of Israel when they backslid, how they corrupted themselves, and how they went quickly out of the way, and how they followed the lifestyle and the worship of the Egyptians. Abstain from any kind of worship that appears that, like, that, like that of the Egyptians. You remember they are singing and they are dancing? Abstain from anything that looks like the dancing and the singing and the music of Egypt. You remember the feast? Abstain from anything that looks like the feasting of the Egyptians. And you remember the nakedness? You remember their clothing and you remember how they appeared abstain from any style that looks like that of Egypt abstain from all appearance of evil in our relationship together in the work in which they were, that we're doing in the profession that we bring to serve the Lord in the skill that we bring to serve the Lord abstain from anything that appears like that's how they do it in the world. How oppressive they are in the world. How dangerous they are in the world. How terrible, devastating they are in the world. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it.
they will do it for every one of us in Jesus' name. But then we have a responsibility. Come out. We're coming now to point number three. The progressive cons consecration to the Lord's service. The progressive consecration to the Lord's service. We're looking at Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, verse 29. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today unto the Lord. Consecrate yourself unto the Lord today, even every man upon his son. If your son is there, consecrate yourself, come out. If your son will not come out with you, don't say, it's my son. I must walk along with him. I must go along with him. Consecration demands that if your son or your daughter or anyone close to you decides to go on in the way of corruption, you will identify yourself, single out yourself, distinguish yourself, consecrate yourself unto the Lord. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today unto the Lord. Even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day, the blessing of restoration, consecrate. The blessing of being on the Lord's side, when you come to the Lord's side, you have to consecrate yourself. And the blessing of divine favor, you consecrate yourself afresh unto the Lord. Point number three, the progressive consecration to the Lord's service. Progressive consecration to the Lord's service. In First Chronicles chapter 29, First Chronicles chapter 29, I'm reading from verse 5. First Chronicles 29, verse 5. The gold for the things of gold, and the silver for the things of silver, and for all manner of work to be made by the hand of the, of the artificers. And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord. Who then is on the Lord's side? If you're on the Lord's side, the implication is you'll not come and just fold your hand. You'll not come and be idle. You will come and consecrate your service unto the Lord this day. Second Chronicles Chapter 29, I'm reading from verse 15, then we go to verse 31. Second Chronicles, chapter 29, reading from verse 15. In verse 15, and they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves, set apart themselves, consecrated themselves. They surrendered themselves, they cleansed themselves, and they abandoned themselves totally, completely, unreservedly unto the Lord. And they came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. Verse 31. In verse 31, then Ezekiah answered and said, Now ye have consecrated yourselves unto the Lord. Come near and bring sacrifices and thank offerings into the house of the Lord. And the congregation brought in sacrifices 
and thank offerings and as many as were of a free heart burnt offerings consecration they came to the Lord's service the skill consecrated to the Lord their profit consecrated to the Lord their abilities consecrated to the Lord Micah chapter 4 in Micah chapter 4 reading from verse 13 Micah chapter 4 verse 13 Arise and stretch O daughter of Zion for I will make thine horn iron and I will make thy hoofs brass and thou shalt beat in pieces many people and I will consecrate thee again unto the Lord I will consecrate thee again unto the Lord and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth he expects that what we have, what we possess, what we have amassed will be consecrated for use in the kingdom of God. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15. First Corinthians 16, 15. In First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15, I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanas, that it tastes the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. That's sanctification, that's consecration, that's absolute surrender. They have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints but then we're talking about progressive consecration to the Lord's service if we are progressing in the Lord's service it means our consecration is increasing our consecration is progressing and why should it increase why should it progress the Lord is not a static Lord the Lord is not a stationary Lord. So our consecration is not static. Our consecration to the Lord is not stationary. As we grow in the knowledge of his word, we grow in consecration. As we grow in the knowledge of his will, we grow in consecration. As we grow in the assignment that God gives us, we grow in consecration. Number one, we grow in teachableness. We don't say, I've had enough, I've learned enough, I've been taught enough, I don't need any other, everything I knew before, that's enough. If you are continuing to serve the Lord, and you are growing in consecration. Number one, you have more teachableness. We're coming to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 13. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 13. Better is a poor and wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. More consecration means more teachableness. It means more prayerfulness. That we endeavor to pray today more than we prayed yesterday. And we pray on spiritual things today more than we prayed yesterday. That the item and the request of our prayer is going higher and growing deeper more prayerfulness. I'm coming to, num uh, to Luke chapter 21. And we're reading from verse 36. Luke 21, verse 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy 
to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. You see, the prayer here is a higher kind of prayer. It's a deeper kind of prayer. It's not praying for material things. We're praying to be accounted worthy to escape the great tribulation, the things that shall come upon the earth. We pray and we have more watchfulness. If we're consecrated to the Lord in a higher way, in a greater way, and in a deeper way, there'll be more watchfulness as we see the day approaching. If you are living a kind of a carefree life before, and you were not very watchful, you are now going to have more watchfulness. First Thessalonians chapter 5. I read from verse 2. First Thessalonians 5. I'm reading from verse 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as they travail upon a woman or child, and they shall not escape. But she, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day shall come, shall overtake you, as they see. Ye are all the children of light, the children of the day. Ye are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Our consecration will demand more teachableness, more prayerfulness, more watchfulness, more holiness. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 10. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10, tells us in chapter 12, verse 10, for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our own profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. As we learn more deeply about the holiness of God, we are partakers of what we learn, of His holiness, of His attribute, of His nature, of His character, of His firmness, of all the attributes of God. More holiness, give me. More sorrow for sin, more watchfulness. Number five, more faithfulness. As we say that we have come now to the side of the Lord, we now we are more watchful. Any Aaron wants to bring any compromise, any corruption, we say no. Oh, they say it's a little thing. This one is not major. This is light sin. I need to have more faithfulness. In Luke chapter 16, Luke chapter 16, I read from verse 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. In your Christian life, in your Christian service, you don't excuse slight errors, slight carelessness, slight unfaithfulness, and say this is not major. And this is private, and it's not going to affect the service. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. And then, number six, more deadness to the world more deadness to sin, more deadness to the evil society. You are not going along with them. You are dead to them. The things uh, they do do not excite you. They do not interest you. 
you are totally dead to them. You are insensitive to them. What the people are excited about in the world, you have more deadness to the things of the world. We're looking at Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Not excited about it. Dead indeed unto sin. And any other thing coming from the world. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey each in the lusts thereof. Number seven, more godliness. More godliness. Anything you are doing, any decision you are taking, anywhere you want to go, any practice you want to manifest, how do this tally with the godliness of the Almighty himself? It tells us in Second Peter chapter 3, Second Peter chapter 3, from verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in not holy conversation and godliness? More teachableness, more prayerfulness, more watchfulness, more holiness, more faithfulness, more deadness to the world, more godliness, more truthfulness, more truthfulness. Anything that will not be exactly, perfectly truthful, you throw away. There's no reason, number one, as who we are, members and ministers of deeper life, Bible church. There's no reason to be afraid of anybody and then to tell him what is less than the absolute truth. And there's no reason not to tell you want to influence somebody, influence him with the truth. There's no reason to kind of change something, make it make a lie. I have a good purpose, I have a good reason. I'm telling the lie so that he can shape up. He can do the right thing. How do you do that? You're trying to have somebody in the will of God and you are getting that will of God from the message of Satan. If we're consecrating to the Lord, there's more truthfulness. We're looking at Psalm 15, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 15, Verses 1 and 2, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly, and walketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. No hypocrisy, no partial truth, no partial lying. No white lie, dark lie, professional lying, psychological lying, playful lying, nothing like that. He speaketh the truth in his heart. More truthfulness, more fearlessness. As we continue to serve God, and he calls us who is on the Lord's side, we're not looking back and looking at Aaron, how will Aaron feel? How will the tribe of Manasseh feel? How will the tribe of Reuben feel? How will the others feel? We don't look at anybody. We're fearless. More fearlessness. In Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. I read from verse 2. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither heed that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have heard in the light, that with that, with and that, 
which ye have spoken in the ear in the closest shall be proclaimed upon the house doors. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that they have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear, fear him which after he has killed as power to cast into hell, yea, I say unto you, fear him. Notice verse 4, I say unto you, my friends, and yet the friends of Christ, if they become fearful, they are frightened, and because of the fear, they compromise and they do not fear God. The Lord Jesus said, my friends, fear him who after he has killed the body, he can cast into hell. If the believers have nothing to fear, they are saved, they are forever saved. Christ would not have said that. And then number 10, more humbleness. As we consecrate ourselves to the Lord and we're having more consecration that demands more humbleness, humbleness of mind. Colossians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 12. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Put on therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, Humbleness of mind. Humbleness of mind. Humbleness of mind. Meekness, long suffering. Our more our consecration that is progressive demands more openness. There mustn't be any secrecy in our lives. We want to serve the Lord openly, serve the Lord. You're preaching the truth openly. Preach the truth. You're standing for righteousness openly. Stand for righteousness. You're uncompromising openly. Be uncompromising. More openness. Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 26 and verse 27. Matthew chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 26. It says in verse 26, Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and heat that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in the light. And if we're like Jesus Christ, that's what I tell people. Whatever I tell you, you can say it anywhere. Whatever I'm revealing to you, you can say it anywhere. Whatever I partner with you to do, you can broadcast it anywhere. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the house tops. And then number 12, more willingness. You are consecrated to the Lord more willingness today than ever before. Willingness to serve the Lord. Willingness to lay everything on the altar. Willingness to do everything the Lord has uh, given you to do. Willingness in Psalm 110. I'm reading from verse 3. Psalm 110, verse 3. Verse 3. That people shall be willing in the day of thy power and in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning that thou hast the dew of thy youth. I pray God will grant us more grace, more love, more dedication, more consecration. In our lives we will not be going back. In our lives we will not be looking back. In our lives will not be backsliding. In our lives will not be decreasing a commitment to the Lord. There will be more teachableness in every life. 
more prayerfulness in every life, more watchfulness in my life, in your life, more holiness in our lives together, more faithfulness in little things and big things, more deadness to the world, more godliness, more truthfulness, more fearlessness, more humbleness, more openness, and more willingness in the service of the Lord in Jesus' name. Who is on the Lord's side? You are on the Lord's side. Rise up and tell the Lord, I am on the Lord's side. And anywhere you see, you have been going back little by little, and you have been changing things little by little. You are becoming lazy and idle and not as fervent as you were before. Now you want to come back to the Lord to say, Lord, I come back fully with total consecration, absolute surrender. I am on the Lord's side.